Kosovo. Uh, so we had to so we had to decide to start off with uh, this very important topic, uh, Afghanistan, the end of um, uh, for uh, I mean a forever ending, never ending war or whatever it is. Um, but anyway, uh, I just wanted to begin by saying that uh, I wanted especially to welcome our four panelists and also uh, welcome the audience. Uh, for uh, and for being so uh, flexible in adjusting the time, uh, because you know we've changed the time for the pandemic and also to allow um, uh, South Asian participants to join us. And we'll be hearing uh, from one a top analyst from South Asia today, which is why we are meeting at 11 a.m. I'd like to thank uh, Fiza Shahzad, our new graduate assistant uh, for the Center for South Asian Indian Ocean Studies for uh, taking care of the logistics of this. And thanks is also due to Daniel Vakar, who's managing, uh, he's a, a doctoral student at the history department. He's managing the technical side of the webinar uh, today. And also uh, finally the history department itself at Tufts uh, for their logistical support. Uh, we have four excellent panelists uh, and I'm going to begin by introducing Nilofa uh, Saki. Uh, first of all, who's the director of policy and diplomacy at Wickham and Company and a professorial lecturer at the International uh, Affairs School at Elliott, uh, the Elliott School at uh, George Washington University. Uh, she did her doctoral work at uh, George Mason University. She's a scholar and a policy practitioner, has written extensively on transitional security and human security, peacemaking and peace building processes. Her recent book is on uh, human security and agency, uh, reframing productive power uh, in Afghanistan. Apart from her security studies, Nilofa, uh, I mean, her region focuses on South Asia as a whole, Afghanistan and Iran. She's the founder of uh, Women's Activities and Social Services Association, BASA, uh, the first women-led organization in the Western part of Afghanistan. Uh, she's also held several prestigious uh, fellowships uh, at institutions like the National Endowment of, for Democracy, Columbia University, and uh, the Asia Society. Uh, Ahmed uh, Rashid, it's really wonderful to have you, uh, Ahmed, on the panel. Uh, needs no introduction to an audience uh, interested in Afghanistan. Um, he's uh, a well-known analyst and writer. He's the author of five major books, uh, including the best-selling Taliban, um, uh, which came out, which was just really a perfect timing of the book uh, because 9-11 happened soon as it appeared. Uh, and of course, Descent into Chaos, uh, excellent study of the US uh, disaster in Afghanistan involving Pakistan and several Central Asian countries. Uh, he contributes regularly uh, to the Financial Times, the New York Times, the New York Review of Books, uh, BBC Online, has been the regional correspondent for the number of years, 20 years at least, for the Far Eastern Economic Review. And he is the recipient of innumerable uh, awards, uh, including um, uh, the foreign policy magazine's most important 100 global thinkers uh, in 2009 and 2010. More recently, he's been a member of uh, the um, uh, ICG, the International Crisis Group's Board of Trustees. Rory, uh, it's really want wonderful to welcome you finally at, at, at Tufts. Uh, Emma, I'm welcoming back to Tufts, uh, but Rory, is, it's a real pleasure to have you today. Uh, he's a senior fellow at the Jackson Institute at Yale University. Uh, Rory um, focuses on issues of international development uh, and inter intervention in unstable conflict-ridden uh, states. Uh, he served in several different capacities, including UK Secretary of State, um, a time that he used to double um, <clears throat> Britain's investment in international climate uh, change and environment concerns. Well done, Rory. Um, <clears throat> he's been an he's been he's had a really amazing career: uh, infantry officer, a diplomat for the UK government in Indonesia, um, the Balkans, Iraq. Uh, he's uh, founded and managed the Turquoise Mountain Foundation in Afghanistan and has been the director. This is the last time I met him, some, some several years ago, when he was director at the Car Center. Uh, and the Ryan family professor of human rights at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. Uh, he's the author of four books, um, including uh, The Places in Between, Occupational Hazards, or The Prince of the Marshes, GAN intervention work. Um, so he's an extraordinarily uh, uh, I mean, appropriate uh, person to speak about this event that we are talking about, our discussion on Afghanistan. Um, last but not least uh, is uh, Benjamin Hopkins. Uh, he's a historian of modern South Asia. Uh, who works on the history of Afghanistan and British imperialism in the Indian subcontinent. He's uh, at George Washington, where he teaches South Asia. 
um, uh, and he's been director of the Siegel Institute for Asian Studies at George Washington uh, since 2016. He's authored, co-authored, um, and co-edited co innumerable books on the region, including The Making of Modern Afghanistan, Fragments of the Frontier, Afghan Frontier, uh, and Beyond Swat, History, Society, and Economy Along the Afghan-Pakistan Border. His new book, his latest book, Harvard University Press publication, Ruling the Savage Periphery, Frontier Governance and the Making of the Modern State. I highly recommend to those who haven't had a chance to read it yet. Um, uh, and it examines the limits, uh, something that's very, very topical today, the limits of today's state-based state political order uh, that was really organized uh, in the late colonial, uh, in late 19th century by, by, by the colonial state in, in India, uh, which has had a lasting effect, he shows very uh, well in the book um, to the present day. He's currently working on a concise history of Afghanistan, which I'm sure is not easy. Uh, for Cambridge University Press, always the hardest thing to do. But then he's also writing a manuscript, which we're really much looking forward to, about the continuing war in Afghanistan, which is provisionally entitled The War That Destroyed America. Uh, so I really want to warmly welcome all of you uh, to this um, uh, panel discussion. I'm going to begin with Nilofa. I asked all of you to speak, to make some opening remarks. I might ask a question before we open it all up um, uh, to the audience at the end. Uh, so maybe we can begin with Nilufa. Nilufa, uh, you know, we are all sort of obviously heartbroken by this, the images we've been seeing uh, on television, um, the, the news coverage. Uh, and I know you have family in Afghanistan. Could you give us a sense really, in addition to whatever you want to say about really what's happening on the ground? Uh, because really we want to somehow be able to empathize better than we can through media uh, uh, sound bites. So thank you and welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Jalal, and thanks to the Tufts University for inviting me. Uh, it's an honor to be uh, with my fellow panelists on this panel. Well, uh, as you highlighted, uh, there are there has been a lot happening from last one month. The, uh, the unfolding events uh, was tragic for for the majority of the population, and there was no expectation that Taliban would uh, uh, yeah there was kind of expectation Taliban will take would take over but not the collapse of a system so the collapse of a system was not part of uh, many of the perceptions inside Afghanistan therefore it shocked everyone and it was a rapid takeover that some argue which I don't think it was a rapid takeover of the Taliban I'll, I'll come to that point that has shocked everyone and uh, created fear and frustration among the population in large and it seems the nation is in the process of uh, healing at the moment. I am in, in, in conversation with, with various factions inside Afghanistan, uh, and uh, there is a, a high level of um, uh, depression, frustration uh, inside the, uh, the country among the population, men and women, uh, and many are still planning to leave, trying to escape from the Taliban. Um, and, well, uh, there are news, the states that Taliban have changed in many, instance, but based on what I hear, what report says, and what I, I, I have a direct communication with people over there, it says uh, the evidence showed that there hasn't been really a drastic change in their behavior and attitude in different parts of the country, which also created another layer of frustration and fear about the future of them and their children, that people are fearful of what will happen to this. So overall, there has been, and the tragic events have created really a high level of uh, frustration among the among the uh, population. On the other hand, we all are hearing about the humanitarian crisis, economic crisis, and the uh, internally um, displaced population that's in rise. And um, said that they are also adding uh, to uh, the frustration of people and make people think about the, uh, the alternative, which is finally to leave the country. Uh, so with that, I just uh, um, uh, certainly, I, I would like to answer more if there will be questions about the current events and how, how um, unfolding events are, are creating um, further uh, uh, chaos within the population at the end, if there would be question on that. But before that, for the introductory, uh, my introductory remarks, which you give me five minutes to talk about it, I would like to discuss uh, a couple of points here. First, how did we get here? And second, um, where we are going next? So um, I believe there are many, many factors that contributed to the situation where we are today. Uh, where we are today means that there, there is humanitarian crisis, economic crisis in the country, there are high level of uh, 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 fear, exist human security crisis and insecurity which exists in the country. 
the high level of uh, uh, people um, who left the country, the refugee crisis. So why we are uh, and what are the factors that contribute to the situation? I would there are many by the way, but I will reflect on, on a few of them. Well, um, there is a narrative that the Taliban took over was rapid. Uh, and that was a, that's considered both inside Afghanistan and outside Afghanistan by many analysts that that was a rapid takeover. Well, to my reading, the um, Taliban were winning slowly from 2016 um, uh, and the US was losing more territory to, to them. Um, and there was a high level of violence also since then. But the Taliban actually started organizing themselves since 2003. And uh, when the, another longest war of the United States started, which was Iraq, and they had more control and influence of the, uh, on the rural population through organizing their um, uh, governance system and um, uh, putting in place their governance system and um, uh, gathering more support and allies from those rural population, which are going to report 75% of the population of Afghanistan live in the rural areas. So they had their they had their organized structures in place, informal but organized since two thousand and three. One of the reasons behind those um, um, behind the, the the fact that why Taliban were able to to organize themselves since two thousand and three onward, and I'll tell my own stories that back and forth I was traveling in many parts of the remote areas and how I change. The, the, the rise in radicalization in different parts of the country, especially in the remote areas and rural areas. In 2009, 10, and then I traveled 2014, 15, for a number of projects and research that I was doing across the country. And you could see the graph, the graph of radicalized movement were up and down during different time frame. So based on those graphs, I just analyzed that well, and, 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 I, and I had communication, I had, I had interaction with a number of with, with people, with elders, religious leaders conservatives, radicals of, the, of those time. And then there were, there were a number of reasons that people used to highlight. And I put in my, in my book also when I talk about those reasons. The first, uh, the first was the in, uh, internal factor, which was upon government and efficiency. Uh, both President Kurzweil time, President Kurzweil government and President Ghani's government. Uh, the inefficiency to expand its control and influence on many parts of the country. And that relates to uh, the unequal distribution of resources, lack of law enforcement, and, uh, uh, and that actually created um, opportunities for the Taliban to recruit for so food soldiers uh, from those population, and that gave them an easy path. In addition to those internal causes, there was corruption in, in a highly centralized system of government, which also um, uh, their leaders abuse their power and, and, and that created a gap between the population and the system in Kabul. That was the second one. And, but not, uh, and the last but not the least, the ethnic rivalries over power and resources existed within the administration in Afghanistan, which prevented leaders to present a united front for the interests of the country. And they were all individualistic based interests that they were fighting over without putting forward a, a united front for the national interests of the country. And, uh, and, and, they, and there's all factors actually from last 20 years, if we just analyze and assess 20 years, have, have uh, uh, created and provided ample opportunities to the, to the Taliban to have their influence on all those remote areas, which is 75% of 0.5 of the population. And then during my own analysis and assessment, when I traveled from nine, 2005, six, seven, eight was a good time, consider a good, good time till 2008. 2009, during the second election of President Karzai, we have seen that the high rise of the Taliban in those remote areas, because there was less control, less law, law enforcement, and the, the, radical, uh, the radicalized part of society were very active during 2010, 11, and 12, actually based, again, based on my, my area of research that I highlight here. And uh, so, so that, that added, that added to, uh, to the strength of the Taliban to expand their influence in all those remote urban areas or urban population. Now come to 2000, now it, uh, it comes, uh, here it comes to 2018 talks. That was the one element of their strength. The second element of strength is of course the 2018 talks with the Taliban, which contributed significantly to their strength. And the Doha agreement, agreement, which became a convenient path for the, for the withdrawal without a significant consideration of political settlement. Yes, the, there's no doubt that the Doha 
process, uh, which consisted of a US-Taliban relationship, intra-Afghan talks, and then regional relationship. It had three components associated with it. And, uh, um, but it further provided opportunities to the Taliban to expand their control, their territory control. How? Well, I think the Doha process was flawed in many ways. Uh, the way it started, the sequencing of events, and um, uh, yes, it, the Doha deal was a cessation of hostilities between the two parties in an in, in, in armed conflict, uh, which was United States and the Taliban. But the political settlement uh, um, aspect was, was uh, not pushed hard and, and not paid a lot of attention. Uh, there were um, the intra, it provided an opportunity for intra on talk to begin, but did not push a lot, the, both the parties, the Republic and the Taliban to come to an agreement. There were spoilers both from the Republic side and the Taliban lack of interest after uh, President Biden took office. There was lack of and complete lack of interest from the Taliban to sit at the table of negotiation and talk. So that those elements were, were missing then from January of 2021. Uh, and that added a lot to the, to the failure of the, of the talks. And on the other hand, um, the, 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 the platform, the, the Doha platform actually give a lot of international recognition. Um, and having we can also recognition, but it provided international platform to the Taliban. Soon when the Doha deal was signed, Moscow, Beijing, Tehran, reach out to the Taliban, invited them to, to their places in order to build a relationship because they want the perception that the next power holders will be the Taliban. That, that raised the morale of the Taliban at the battlefield. On the other hand, politically, they were getting more strength uh, uh, and that gave them the, the, the already a perception that they, are in the, that they were in the winning position. Internally inside Afghanistan, there was also a perception generated soon after Doha deal was signed. And that was that, well, there were so many conspiracy theories, but overall among people, there was a perception that um, the United States has reconciled with the Taliban and, and uh, with the United States withdrawal, especially its forces from 15,000 to 2,500. There was already uh, the general perception em uh, uh, emerged inside Afghanistan that the Taliban in the winning position. So that also raised the morale of the foot soldier in the battlefield, which uh, is strong. And Taliban, uh, the tactic and tool was violence from the beginning. And they pushed that violence harder and harder through target killing, through a number of other uh, violent acts throughout the country in order to assert their position at the negotiation table in the Doha. So there are these factors added to the Taliban uh, uh, took over, which I don't consider that was a rapid took over, that was a took over which um, uh, its roots were planted since 2003. And there was events like the Doha process, which further contributed significantly to that and which further strengthened them both in the battlefield and in their position of, of, of presenting themselves in the, in the negotiation table. Now, do I have time, Dr. Gerald? Should I continue? I stop here. Well, I mean, I'm so riveted by what you're saying that I am going to give you time. <laughs> Please carry on. We have enough time. I mean, it's just to really get the audience to ask you the questions at the end. So I'll keep, because I mean, this is an excellent staging uh, ground for what you so Carry on, please. Uh, and, oh, and just wrap up. I, I, I have a few more points now uh, in relation to what happened now. Now, the questions are, uh, the questions now here are, are the Taliban changed? One. Is the war over? So there are two questions that we are assessing. We're in the position of assessing right now. Well, it's early, very early to, to, to find the right answer for all for both this question. Taliban changed or no? Is the war over or, or still continue? So the answer, at least, the, the, the first answer that comes in mind in relation to have the Taliban changed initially in the very first week, soon after they took over. They showed flexibility. I mean, I was in contact with, with many inside Afghanistan about, and asking serious questions from the, from the people I was in contact with about security, about their relation, about their relation with other ethnic groups, about their attitude towards women. I, I, I think these are that we have some stories from them from 1996-2001. So the, now from last one month, especially with their caretaker government or interior government in place, which is consists of their hard line of which is consistent of the Taliban, with, um, uh, consistent of the um, uh, Haqqani um, uh, leadership. 
with all respects and with add some other rules that they have put in place for restricting women from school, from work, from media, and from all these places. And with some public execution report that we get from all the across the country. And with some limitation that they put on all the on a number of ethnic groups around the country that there are reports, by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm talking based on the reports. This evidence highlights that there hasn't been fundamental change in the ideology of the of the of the Taliban, and uh, and uh, uh, with that, uh, the, the ideal the 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 ideology the, there is narrative. They have the same narrative. They stand the same narrative that based on their ideology and they develop their policies, laws, rules based on those ideology. So with, the, with this all channel of how they form their governance structure, it seems there hasn't been really a change in their, in their attitude. Again, we uh, have to wait and see, but at least the evidence till now demonstrate very well that there hasn't been a significant change in the ideology, attitude, behavior of the Taliban uh, at this point. On the other hand, uh, the lack of capacity and manpower among the Taliban to govern 35 per, uh, million people, this is also an issue right now. I mean, uh, they are the, the, gov uh, the Taliban are inheriting, inheriting some mess from previous uh, government, of course. But now, when the Taliban took over, the country is facing a dire humanitarian crisis a dire economic crisis. Now, these are very, the, 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 the basics of, of people's life there, which are under stake. And I think uh, going forward, what we see based on Taliban's uh, having Taliban experience from 1996, 2001, and now also, the lack of those capacity to govern and the lack of the main power to, uh, to govern as well. So this, this will be the issue that we see whether that, and that hasn't changed by the way, that hasn't changed because even the two, Last two years, when they were involved in the Doha talk, they never presented a strategy for governance, for, for security, for economic development. So we don't know at this point that if they have anything in order to systematically govern those, those 35 uh, million population who are in dire of, of, um, of needs at this point. And, and just uh, finally, I, I'll then stop by there. Stop it there. The, the second question, is the war over? Is the war really over? So this is, this is another question that we need to wait and see, right? Maybe logistically, yes, but conceptually, I don't think so, it's over. Well, uh, we should remember that the US initially went to Afghanistan to, el to eliminate Al-Qaeda and associate terrorist groups, right? But the threats are still there. I mean, Taliban uh, did not uh, cut ties with all those uh, terrorist groups or associated, uh, or with uh, Al-Qaeda. And then the return of the Taliban is a great victory for the jihadists in the region and their narratives. And those narratives are the foundation upon which they build their ideology. So, and that's the one aspect. And on the other uh, side, the socioeconomic conditions in Afghanistan with the, with the uh, Taliban in, in power, it, it's again ripe for radicalization and terrorism. So there are, these are the factors that makes us think about the nature of the war, if it's over, if another war is coming up, if, uh, if, uh, uh, and what to expect actually going forward. I stop here and I will come back to the questions. Thank you, Nilofo. You've set us up very nicely. And I will not ask you a question in, uh, in the interest of time, but move on to Emma. Uh, Emma, uh, you know, I, I think you would probably agree that the Taliban haven't changed. Uh, but have, I mean, you've long advocated regional approaches, rightly so. But my question really is, is first I want to obviously let you say what you have to say, but my question really, I'd like you to answer whether anything at all has changed in the regional environment for us to hope for something different. Uh, I mean, listening to uh, Nilofa initially, I thought that, you know, the takeover was inevitable, but then she nuanced it to show that no, there were mistakes made by the Biden administration, by the Trump administration, et cetera, et cetera. But I really want to know from you, whether seen from the, you know, you're sitting in Pakistan, the perspective there, there must be fears of uh, new refugee uh, influx. Uh, and then of course we have the policy of longstanding. So has anything changed on the ground? Uh, if you could answer that as you answer your, as you give us your opening remarks. Thank you, Emma, for coming. 
on this. Well, thank you very much, Aisha, for in, in inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here. Let me, um, let me just start by what has happened today. Uh, President Biden addressed the UN, uh, and he commented on Afghanistan. And at the same time, as if to make sure that they distance themselves enough from the West, the Taliban appointed two new deputy ministers, one Mullah Zakir, who's incredibly close to Al-Qaeda, and um, uh, the other is unknown. And there again, they were both Pashtuns. They, were, they, they are not minor, from any minority. And so what we have on this auspicious day of the opening of the United Nations, with all the pressure that there is on the Taliban to have an inclusive government and to have women and to have the minorities, the Taliban go ahead and appoint two ministers who are very hardline military commanders from, from the days of the war. So I think that kind of answers the question that have they changed? Is there any kind of pressure that can work for them? Unfortunately, we're not seeing it yet. I'm quite happy to give them more time, but time is, is very precious now because of the humanitarian crisis and the complete lack of governance. The Taliban have not provided us with any form of governance. And this reminds me very much of what I experienced in, the, uh, uh, in southern Afghanistan in 94-95 when I spent a lot of time with the Taliban. And, um, and then later Kabul in 96, when they took Kabul, I interviewed most of the cabinet ministers um, and there was nothing for them to do. They had no idea what to do, how to run a government. Uh, they would literally sit in their office and, and um, really do nothing because whatever little activity there was was being run by the United Nations or the NGOs. Um, and unfortunately, I fear very much that after one month, we have not seen any steps being taken by the Taliban towards, um, you know, clearing up these uh, doubts about whether they uh, want women in jobs or not, and clearing up the whole question of what kind of government are you going to set up? We have no idea at the moment. It will be except that it's going to be an Islamic government and a hardline government, but practical in day-to-day -day steps. What are you going to do that will encourage um, um, you know, people to value your government? Has it changed from 93? And uh, my answer to that way is, is not, not much. Um, it's the excuses they're giving for refusing to have women in high school, for example, is exactly the same excuse they gave uh, 20 years ago when they said we can't have women because the environment is not right. We need to improve the uh, security for girls, so then we can send the girls to high school. Now that's what the Taliban are saying today. That's what they said in um, in in 93, 94, and 96 when they took Kabul and they refused to allow any girls into school. And you had all this whole element of clandestine schools working uh, uh, un under the radar um, and people running schools in their homes. So. Uh, I, I, th I think this is really is going, is going to pose a huge dilemma because the further we go, we are not seeing any opening that the Taliban is providing the international community. Um, we, we have yet to see if humanitarian aid is going to come. For example, there's already a demand by the international community that it should be distributed by the NGOs and the UN and, and these organizations that are there, not by the Taliban, because they will use it for their own military had to feed their military. Now, I don't think the Taliban will agree to anything like that. And they will insist upon, you know, uh, taking hold of the aid themselves. And this will pose an enormous dilemma for the international community in the days and weeks ahead. Um, so uh, at the moment, I'm not seeing anything that is going to uh, impress me that they have uh, uh, turned their, changed their mind. Now, um, let me just, uh, you know, I, I, th I agree with you. I think Nilofar has given an excellent introduction. Um, I just want to add to a, a few more long point, uh, long term points about the situation in Afghanistan and how we got here. The first thing is that the Afghans have become incredibly dependent on aid. Um, if you go back to the, the war against the Soviets, um, it was Soviet aid that was propping up uh, the government in Kabul. And it was American weapons that were providing the Mujahideen with their, um, uh, you know, with their wherewithal to fight the Soviets. So both sides 
were right from the start were heavily dependent on, on aid. And that becomes the kind of limit of, of, of all both sides' future uh, action. Um, the, the se my second point is that, and uh, what we could have done, I mean, the Afghans needed to have weaned themselves away from aid, especially after 9-11. But actually that, of course, more aid comes and that causes the massive uh, corruption, uh, et cetera, that we see. So the aid overwhelms um, uh, 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 the Afghan society. They're not able to absorb so much aid um, that, that, that arrives. The second, uh, my, my second point is that the elections, and this is a, 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 a more important intellectual point, elections were too early. Uh, and, and this is the fault of the, the stark difference that I saw between the Americans and the Europeans. Um, the Americans want immediate elections in every conflict that they've entered. If you look at Iraq, uh, you look at uh, Afghanistan, they wanted elections as soon as possible so that they could say, great, we've set up a government, now we can walk away. Now, um, that to my mind, if you look at Afghanistan, the elections on all fronts, but the first election was far too early. If more time had been given to consolidate the state, build up a proper structure of, uh, of uh, governance and uh, economics and um, job creation and that kind of thing, under a caretaker government, which Afghanistan had and under, under, uh, under President Karzai, and um, uh, so elections have been always by the Americans favored too early. The Europeans, by the way, especially the British and the Germans were arguing very strongly for a delay in elections so that you know, there could be time for consolidation. The third was economic structures. It was, um, there was a failure to understand that Afghanistan was an agricultural society. And, um, uh, and we, saw, we knew that very well with the growth of, of opium, et cetera. But there was no, very little investment until much later on in agriculture. It's not only in agriculture. I remember going to see USAID people in Washington and saying, look, Afghanistan is not, is the whole country, you don't have to promote agriculture. It's, it's the valleys, there are valleys in Afghanistan where agriculture flourishes. The rest is desert and mountain where nothing flourishes. So you just have to develop seven or eight key valleys in Afghanistan, and you will increase employment opportunities, food self-sufficiency, um, you know, and then these uh, this agriculture can spin off um, uh, uh, manufacturing in some agricultural goods, etc. There was no understanding of that. Uh, they, everybody wanted to build schools, which was very good, but there was and and there was no concept of economic structure. And I fear that the the uh, influence of the Americans and others in third world countries is is very typical of this kind of behavior, that you don't understand the basic economic motive of the state, which in Afghanistan's case was agriculture, and you don't promote it and you don't um, uh, uh, build it. The fourth, the fourth thing, which uh, I, uh, I, I will just briefly touch on, is that there was very little understanding of the makeup of the Taliban. And when these, and I, I'd like to re remind you that these negotiations, um, uh, peace negotiations were going on um, uh, for a very long time with the Germans, with the, um, uh, with the Japanese, uh, with the American under Richard Holbrook, uh, much before Doha and these recent peace negotiations um, started. And, um, but what these peace negotiations failed to differentiate privately or publicly, was that the Taliban were a, a not a homogeneous force. There were moderates and there were extremists, if I may give you a very naive kind of understanding. And certainly two or three years ago, and even when the Doha talk started, there were moderates within the Taliban movement who saw the need for a peace settlement and a, 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 as long as they got the government, more, more or less, but they saw the need for a peace settlement. And unfortunately, the Western negotiators were really were not able to understand the dynamics of the internal um, movements going on within the ta Taliban movement. And what we saw at the end was that the moderates were ousted, basically. And even today, I mean, the fight between, if reports are true, that there has been a shootout between the Haqqanis and, and, 
uh, Mullah Brother. Uh, Mullah Brother, for all intents and purposes, uh, is considered to be not only a moderate, but somebody who wanted peace all along. This is the man who tried to make peace with Hamid Karzai in 2009, and, um, and he was rejected by the Pakistanis and by the Americans. Um, and he was put into jail uh, at the behest of these two, because no, neither neither of these two players wanted particularly wanted peace at that time. So this question of moderate and extremists is very relevant, and there has to be a more a better understanding of Afghan society and the fact that even the Taliban have different um, factions. Um, then there's the whole question of ethnic rivalries. I mean, you know, quite frankly, the the. The only government that I have seen in Afghanistan in all my years there, uh, which actually had plurality and, and uh, some degree of ethnic understanding, was the communist government of President Najibullah. Now, this may be, um, certainly the communist government was awful in everything uh, they did, but what they did was they had a cabinet and they genuinely had a, an understanding that Afghanistan is a multi-ethnic state and we've got to have policies which promote all the ethnicities, including the poorest ones and the most hard done by, which were the Hazaras even then, at that time, as they still are today. And uh, um, so no government in Afghanistan since then has really regarded the, ethnicity, uh, the uh, minority ethnic groups as partners, as real partners in government and governance. And that has been a, a huge mistake. Um, and, you know, I mean, there's always been a lot of sympathy for the minority ethnic groups, but there's never been a, a coherent plan of trying to bring them um, in, in, into the uh, government. Um, on the military, I will just make one long-term point. The, when the Americans provided aid to the Mujahideen, quite simply, they defeated the Soviet Union. When the Americans provided aid to the Afghan army after 2004, they built an army in their own image, which was dependent on, on, on logistics and all sorts of things, um, which had nothing to do with the way the Afghans fight or the Afghans organize their, their fighting uh, into Lashkars and into uh, uh, groups under certain commanders, etc. Now, there's a great weakness in this, of course, is that there's, no, there's not much unity, and it's very difficult to build unity in, in military groups, which are run by very um, uh, selfish, if you like, commanders. But the fact is that it, it, this is the way the Afghans fight, whether it was the British or uh, the Soviets. And they, I think that is one of the major reasons why the Afghan army collapsed uh, so quickly, that the, the structure that they were dealt with by the Americans really um, uh, did not have a, 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 a grounding in Afghan culture and Afghan, the whole Afghan warriors. I, I get extremely angry when President Biden calls the Afghans, they just gave up and ran away. As though the, oh, this is the, what, the, 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 the most warrior nations in the world, whether you like it or not. Um, and they fought their, their, their uh, opponents with very little material aid. Um, and so you know, we have to understand why this, uh, why this happened. So I, I will just end here and say that I hope uh, uh, I, I hope I don't have to write another book saying that uh, the the second time the Taliban came in uh, they were as disastrous as the first time and they were incapable of governance. Um, I think the international community will give them time uh, and regionally, uh, Aisha, you mentioned. I just want to make a quick point, which is that there seem to be two groupings right now. Um, China, Russia, Pakistan, and Iran have, have said very categorically that they will recognize the Taliban collectively. Um, they will take a collective decision. They won't do it individually. Uh, but this is very much um, uh, counter the American-European line, which is simply that uh, the Taliban have to demonstrate much greater flexibility and modernity uh, before we can recognize them. So it looks like that regionally we are going to see two groups emerge. Um, one, a very poor group, a nation group, if you like, but backed by China and China's money and aid. And the other group, which will be the West, which I think will be very limited uh, in aid, 
except for the humanitarian aid that I'm sure will flow as a result of the present economic crisis there. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Emma. Thank you so much. Uh, Rory, I'm going to ask you to uh, weigh in on this. Uh, I mean, we've really got a, a, a very deep insight into what's been happening in Afghanistan. But my question really generally to you was, you know, there's been a lot of talk about the missteps taken by the United States. So my question really, I thought, I mean, of course, you have to say what you have to say. But I mean, was the chaos that, 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 that has sort of unfolded, was it inevitable? Uh, or could better decision making and, and what we've heard from um, uh, Emma about the European uh, a, a slightly different take than the Americans, could that have played a different sort of, could it lead us to a different result? Or was this really, I mean, not surprising what all is going on? I mean, so I, I just wanted to see what you where you stood. But let me try and answer very quickly, but we have about 15 minutes left and I'm keen to bring in Ben before we No, no there's plenty of time, don't worry, we have time, so. So oh, okay, you go, go ahead and please <laughs> No, no, it doesn't, does it? Does it finish at 12? No, it doesn't finish at 12. Uh, that's wrong. Uh, it goes on, as far as I'm concerned. At least 90 minutes, if not more. So go ahead. Okay, all right. Um, I can't be with you that long then. I oh, okay. Sorry, sorry. I'm that sorry. Apologies. Um, uh, okay, so to, to answer briefly before I hand over to Ben, um, I, I think these counterfactuals are very, very difficult to prove. Hmm. But everybody has a different theory on what we should have done and how it could have gone better. There's no doubt at all that President Biden was the man who destroyed Afghanistan in the end. That situation which the United States had was sustainable. It was a relatively light number of troops. The Taliban were not in a position to pose a significant threat to US troops. So had he wished to retain 2,500 troops, it would have been possible to prevent the Taliban from seizing the district capital. But the more fundamental problems go back a very, very long way. I mean, for any Afghan who is, you know, let's say 45 years old, it's very difficult to see a stable situation. Ahmed chooses to focus on President Najibullah's regime as an example of perhaps one example of stable government in Afghanistan, but ultimately that regime itself was unsustainable. And that's been true for Dal Khan's regime, that was true for Nur Mohammed Taraki's regime in the late 1970s, for Hafiz Zulur Amin's regime, for Babar Kamal's regime, for Najibullah's regime, for the civil war period, and for the Taliban regime, and for Karzai's regime, and for President Ghani's regime, and I'm sure will be true for the Taliban itself in the future. Their position is incredibly fragile, very, very difficult for them to retain power. And we all doubtless have different theories on why they all failed. You know, what did Nur Muhammad Taraki do wrong? What did Hafiz Zulur Amin do wrong? What did Najibullah do wrong? What did the Americans do wrong? But fundamentally, given that so many different states have existed in Afghanistan in a very short period, right? Within 50 years, people have experimented with monarchy, with nationalist government, with pro-Cuban government, with Moscow occupation with a Northern Alliance dominated government, with a theocracy under the Taliban, with various forms of um, government under, with slightly disturbing forms of government that we've seen under, under Hamid Karzai and Ashraf Ghani, it seems to me prima facie implausible that there are some easy answers or lessons here. Almost everything was tried at different times. And there are plans coming out of the ears. And almost everything that the panelists have mentioned was experimented with at different periods during the last 20 years. Fundamentally, there were two models though, that have been operating since 2001. The first model was Hamid Karzai's model, which was an attempt to run a much more traditional Afghan regime. So if you look at someone like Helmand, it focused on essentially handing the police chief, came from the Nurzai tribe, uh, the army division uh, came from the Barakzai and the governor of the province was from the Alizai community. And these were people who had essentially run Helman province throughout the 1980s and early 90s. They'd been kicked out by the Taliban. They'd come back again in early 2001. They took power again. Now, the question is, was that the right model? Right? What would have happened had we allowed Karzai to do what he wanted in 2003, 4, 5 and continued? We don't know because it was stopped. It was stopped because human rights activists, anti-corruption campaigners, Afghans, internationals decided that this was an unacceptable form of government. So against the wishes of Karzai, 
The international community, led by the British, intervened in that province, toppled the governor, got rid of all these warlords, and tried to create a new form of government. Now, that new form of government proved to be even more calamitous in terms of security in Helmand than the previous form of government, right? Particularly in northern Helmand, maybe not in places like Sangi. I mean, the problem of Afghanistan is that there is so much variation, district by district, region by region. But if you look at northern Helmand, the era around Musakala, essentially when Sher Muhammad al Khanzadeh was the governor of the province, northern Helmand was rather relatively peaceful. When he was re removed, that too became violent chaos along with the rest of them. And this was then repeated, and then Ashraf Ghani came in. Now, Ashraf Ghani came in, and Ashraf, of course, had been pushing against the Karzai model. He'd spent 10 years saying, this guy is running a government of warlords and narco bureaucrats, and it's all corrupt, and there's no legitimate effective government. He wrote a book on how to fix a failed state. He came in as a professor from John Hopkins, and he tried to implement an incredibly technocratic vision of an Afghan government went from a decentralized Karzai model to a centralized Ashraf model. And yet again, it all went wrong. And yet again, the international community threw up its hands. And just as they turned against Hamid Karzai, so they turned against Ashraf Ghani and began criticizing him behind his back. So the common theme there, of course, is the international community's complete inability to ever accept the elected leader of Afghanistan is actually in charge of their country. Right? Endless attempts to micromanage. Anytime anybody criticized these people, the international community would undermine whatever they were trying to do. And maybe they would have failed anyway, who knows? Right? Maybe President Karzai was no good, maybe President Ghani was no good. But, but certainly we know the idea of internationals coming in and trying to micromanage these things was equally unsustainable. Now we've left and it's been handed over to the Taliban. Right? And the Taliban are also going to fail to govern Afghanistan for all the reasons that Ahmed has just laid out. Right? Fundamentally, there is not enough revenue in Afghanistan to pay for any of the things that anybody wants to do in Afghanistan. And these problems, corruption, governance, rural insurgency, ethnic conflict, drug production, have been features of Afghan polity since the late 1970s. They are features of many fragile conflict states around the world. Right? They were features of Pakistan in the 1970s. They're features of Nigeria today. They're features of Myanmar today. They're features of most of Sub-Saharan Africa. The idea that somehow the international community had some secret source, some recipe, if only they'd done this, if only they'd done that, almost every one of those things that has been recommended would have had its own problems, would have caused its own catastrophe. And the fundamental underlying problem is that nobody has a decent account of how Afghanistan can be governed, right, on that over to Ben. Aisha, you're muted. You're muted. Apologies. Uh, thank you, Rory, for an excellent um, summation. I, I agree with you, and I think you've set up Ben very nicely. Ben, is there any silver lining at all? I mean, this is rather depressing. I mean, I know you're writing a book on the war that destroyed um, uh, America, but uh, I mean, is there anything at all that you see here that could be different and could be retrieved for a slightly different outcome? But it's quite depressing. Go ahead. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's even more depressing. But, um, well, f first, I, I uh, thank my fellow panelists for, I think, what really is a tour de force of, of looking at this and, and raising some of the key issues. I mean, Rory's uh, uh, really eloquent setup of that it's a pathology of the Afghan state, I think, is one that has been unrecognized for far too long. Um, but uh, if I could just... Um, because I'm cognizant of time and how active the Q&A is, I'll just make uh, three points um, with regard to my comments. Um, the, the, the first has to do actually with the title, uh, Afghanistan, the end of a forever war question mark. And I think the answer to that is no on a couple of uh, different elements. Um, Nilafar talked about how this may be a pause um, it's unclear yet, you know, how this is going to resolve itself within Afghanistan. We need to remember that there's actually two separate wars we're talking about. The internal war within Afghanistan that has lasted for the entirety of the life of Rory's 45-year-old Afghan. Um, and the 20-year war that the United States would like to think it's withdrawn from. 
But we all know that that's not true. The United States has simply withdrawn its troops from theater, but continues with what it now terms as over the horizon operations. In a way, this actually makes the continuance of the war easier because there's no troops on the ground. So it's very easy now for the Biden administration or any subsequent administration to prosecute this war out of you know, flight um, decks in South Dakota that are flying drones in Afghanistan, Yemen, Somalia, and around the world. So um, on a very practical note, no, I don't think the war is over. But I also think there's a difference between the ending of violence or the ending of the war and the fashioning of peace. And we are at a point where within Afghanistan itself, we could potentially, though I think the panel comes around to the doubtful proposition that we were are at the end of violence. Um, I mean, we're obviously in an interregnum um, where the Taliban is trying to establish its authority. Um, but I think there are, for the reasons that have been stated by my fellow panelists, uh, significant reasons to doubt that a durable, peaceful solution to Afghanistan is really on the cards. Uh, part of this has to do with what I would say Rory has brought up with the pathologies of the Afghan state. Part of this has to do with the specific actors. We're talking about the Taliban that Nilafar and, and Ahmed really show have not changed that much. Um, and then the third point I'd make about the war being over or not is that um, we kid ourselves when we think of wars ending. Wars don't end as much as they unwind. Um, whereas, you know, in the popular press, it's a picture of the last American uh, cargo jet to take off from Hamid Kazai Airport on uh, at the end of August. Um, the, there's still an entwined economy, political and otherwise of violence that manifests itself in Afghanistan and beyond Afghanistan. And it's going to take a very long time to unwind that. So for those reasons, I'd, I'd say the war is not over. Um, pivoting quickly to what I think are some of the challenges of governance for the Taliban or anybody else ruling Afghanistan. And here, I think uh, a masterful job has been done by my fellow panelists. But I, I um, begin by noting one thing that's common, a common refrain in the press reporting, at least in the United States, is the kind of uh, refrain that the United States failed because we tried to nation build. I mean, that's exactly what the president said. And to sound like you know a pure academic, I do want to make a distinction with the difference, which is the United States never tried to nation build. It tried to state build. And there's a very dis important distinction to be made there, because what we're talking about are two different pathologies. A pathology which says the problem in Afghanistan is ethnic strife and fragmentation, or a pathology which says that there are fundamental problems with the structure of the Afghan state. I think that historically, the uh, sensibility of an Afghan national identity has actually been very strong. The link of that sense of Afghan nationalism to state authority has been very weak. I would actually support what uh, Nilafar and Ahmed has said, that actually ethnicity has become supercharged really ever since the Soviet occupation. And then it's become an increasing problem over time politically for the Afghan body politic. The interesting thing, again, to refer to President Biden, is that um, Western policymakers like to put the ethnic strife in terms of an ahistorical uh, event, something that actually transcends time and history, when actually I'd say it's very much a recent historical phenomenon. But I'd say that when we look at an Afghan national identity, it's actually quite developed and, and fairly secure, although definitely under challenge today. On the other hand, and this really echoes what Rory said, is about the pathologies of the Afghan state. And it goes back to a point that Ahmed brought up, which is from the 1970s onwards, we have a state that is in effect a subsidy state. It goes much further back. It goes to the 19th century when the Afghan state is constructed. When the British signed the Treaty of Gandamak in 1879, included in its provisions is an annual subsidy of 600,000 Indian rupees, which goes from Peshawar to Jalalabad every July. That just codifies what had hitherto been existing colonial practice. Now, practice of a subsidy state, a state whose political economy is fundamentally dependent on others paying for it, comes right through the 20th century. At times it comes as a formal subsidy in terms of a colonial power delivering it. At times it comes in the form of aid projects like the Helmand Valley Authority or the Salang Tunnel and the, um, and the 
the Northern Soviet aid, or at times it comes through direct pay patronage, like the Soviet government supporting its client state or the United States supporting uh, the Ghani administration. I mean, the last fiscal uh, budget we have for the Ghani administration, 2019, about 60% of that budget is provided by foreign subsidy. And that has to do not necessarily, though it's exacerbated by the corruption of the political class, it's got to do with the design of the state. It was set up that way. Why? So surrounding foreign imperial powers could easily influence it without the high cost of actually occupying and governing it. Um, the other two things I'd say about challenges of governance then are uh, the stakes of the ongoing war in Afghanistan. As I said, when we talk within Afghanistan, we're talking about a 43 year war. We need to understand what's at stake in that war. What is the central issue of that war? And to me, looking as a historian, I would say that up until 1978, Afghanistan had a stable, working, though incomplete political compact, where essentially you had a multi-ethnic state governing over a select number of urban centers that made the pretense of being the sovereign over the countryside, knowing it would never exercise that sovereignty. In the countryside, you had a population that was willing to do this kind of kabuki theater and recognize that as long as the state did not interfere too much. With the Sao revolution in 1978, we have a communist regime that tries to fundamentally rewrite that compact, inserting the state into the countryside and it all collapses. That is the essential nature of the ongoing war in Afghanistan to my mind, that that central political compact collapsed in 1978 and has not been meaningfully reconstructed. Do I think the Taliban are in a position to do that? I have my doubts. But I also think that we've had other people attempt that and not do so very successfully. But to my mind, this uh, violence will continue until that is, is really an existential and a centrally important question that needs to be dealt with. There's also practicalities of governance that the Taliban or whoever governs Afghanistan needs to deal with. One is this political economy of the subsidy. Who is going to pay for governing Afghanistan? Because Rory and Ahmed and Neelafar are all right. It cannot pay for itself. The second is the issue of political legitimacy. How is that manufactured, maintained, and uh, uh, safeguarded through time? You can do it with violence for a certain amount of time, but that, that, that's a limited strategy. So what are the bases of political legitimacy for the Taliban or any other government. And then finally, um, to go back to Rory's 45-year-old Afghan, we have a population that two-thirds of the Afghan population would be younger than that 45-year-old. In fact, more than half of the Afghan population was born after the American occupation in 2001, in which case we have a population that has radically different expectations of what a state has to deliver to it. And that's been touched upon by all the panelists today about the failure of the Karzai and the Ghani administration to deliver on that. That remains the case for the Taliban. You have a population that expects certain things from a state and they are going to have to deliver if they want any medium to long-term viability. Finally, um, I think that as we end this war, is very, very, very fundamentally important for us to think of the costs of the war, something that receives much too little attention. I mean, we have, and I'm gonna you know, paraphrase the Disraeli quotation of there's lies, damn lies, and then there's statistics. The statistics that we have about the war actually occlude more than they reveal. The um, number of 140,000 Afghan killed is uh, a gross, undercount, as we know, and does not include any of the um, wounded, nor does it include the psychological scars of 43 years of war. I mean, this is a, a country that socially as a community, but also individually is deeply marked by post-traumatic stress uh, syndrome. And that says nothing, for instance, about the environmental devastation that Afghanistan has suffered and continues to suffer and leads into humanitarian crises like the present drought. There's the cost to the United States, which are almost incalculable. We hear again, $2.2 trillion, um, 2,500 wound, uh, uh, service personnel killed. Again, these disguise more than they reveal. Actually, it's the most expensive war in American history, inflation adjusted, and it's almost all been done on credit. 
we have had 2,400 person, service personnel killed, but what about the 4,000 military contractors that have been killed? Which then speaks to the fact that the largest discretionary part of the federal budget, the defense budget, now goes in the main to private contractors. 53% of our defense budget goes to pay private contractors like BAE systems for things that were previously done uh, by the US military itself. What effect does that have over time on a democracy? Famously, George Marshall then Seem to have lost Ben. Uh, maybe it'll come back. I should. Um, I'm. I'm just a big apology because I'm going to have to. No, Rory, my apologies on my side. I miscommunicated, uh, but. Uh, uh, I mean, thank you for your excellent presentation, and I will send the questions if we have uh, for you specifically to you. But thank you, many, many thanks. D don't worry at all. And just, just sort of finally, just to say a huge thank you, and just to say I think that um, we need to give credit, I think, to the fact that Afghans tried sincerely over 20 years to come up with solutions to bend the state building paradox. You know, there was nothing wrong with Ashraf Ghani's brain, or indeed Hamad Karzai's brain, or indeed many of the people who served in those cabinets or as ministers. We now are trying to describe them as though they were all incompetent, corrupt, idiotic, had no idea what they were doing. It's not true, right? Many of these people were not corrupt. Some of them were corrupt. Many of them were very smart people with fantastic advanced degrees from some of the best universities in the world. The fact that they failed to govern Afghanistan is not because they failed to recognize certain simple truths that we on the panel can see and they couldn't see. Uh, it's because any one of us uh, being made president of Afghanistan would, I suspect, have failed in that task because of much, much deeper underlying factors and problems. But anyway, thank you all very, very much indeed. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you, you so much, Ori. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. You. Uh, ben, did we, did, did we let you finish your remarks? Because I think that Rory had to go, and my apologies to the audience as well. I didn't realize that there was a miscommunication. Go ahead. Uh, no, I, I, I think that was the, uh, the okay. internet god telling me to stop. Okay, now in the interest of a very patient audience, I'm just going to open up for discussion right away. Uh, I was going to say that we will pose the first few questions to Rory, but Rory has had to leave. So Fiza and Daniel, um, if you could uh, pose the questions or point uh, the direction to, to, our, to our panelists, uh, we'll just open questions. Okay, give me one second. We've got over two dozen questions in the chat. Okay. So All right. Okay. You will. We'll. I'll do them, and I think we might have to dispatch uh, each of them pretty quickly. Um, so I'll go in order of, of them being submitted. Uh, Shabir Ahmadi, um, hi. Thank you for this program. I'm not sure how this question will be proper for this talk, but how do you think the Taliban will take uh, takeover will impact other jihadist groups in the region of the world? Um. Anybody want to, uh, uh, Emmett, uh, do you want to answer no, I think, this? I think, I think one, one point about the Taliban, again, little understood at the time, was the fact that they are, if you like, extremists, fundamentalists, etc. cetera. Um, but but their, their limit, they're not global jihadists like Al-Qaeda. They are national nationalist jihadists, if, if you can conceive of such a term. Um, they, they want to Islamize, Islamize Afghanistan. They don't want to Islamize the whole world. And the problem with the Taliban is that they've uh, allowed many other groups from different parts of the world, Pakistan, Central Asia, um, et cetera, Arabs, uh, to use their soil as, as a training ground and as a ground to organize uh, attacks around the whole world. And I think that has not been understood. People think that Taliban are also just like Al-Qaeda or just like ISIS, but they're not. Um, so far, at least, um, the Taliban have not expressed an interest to Islamize Pakistan or uh, spread their word into Central Asia. But groups under their protection have done that. And just to add a bit, and just to add a bit what uh, um, Mr. Rashid has said about the Taliban, I think one of the, yes, uh, I would see that they would, uh, it would encourage the, the jihadism um, globally, but or I see another component of that. Taliban will reach out if they will have, if they face economic crisis going forward, if they will not have the funding, if they will not be able to generate funding or generate money from inside resources, 
I think they will turn their faces to jihad school to, to get their finances from. So that will, uh, that would change the calculation then because that will make them closer and they're connected uh, and of course, when they give money, uh, the other jihadist group, if they give money and resources, uh, they certainly have their interest also in terms of their ideological interests or power interests, that that, that that will connect them uh, together. So that's another component which I was looking recently into it, that what I, I was looking at actually the sources of money for the Taliban, the sources of finances for the Taliban. And I was looking at that, the other jihadist group that could be potential source of money and finances for the Taliban going forward. I just wanted to say one thing to, in response to Ahmed. Ahmed, you're quite right that the Taliban may be not interested in importing their Islam, but they are aspirational groups uh, who are sort of uh, aspirational uh, Taliban uh, in Pakistan. Uh, and, and so they certainly, I mean, their triumphal narratives of late suggest that they certainly hope that the Taliban in Afghanistan will be a model for Pakistan and other countries to follow. What do you have to say about that? And Ben, please chime in on that, uh, should you have anything to say, or and, and for both of you, because I mean, I think that's a, a concern that I see in some of the questions. I mean, well, yeah, the, uh, I, I mean, one, one of the areas that, that I said that the war is not over, the war, uh, because I, I mean, I, I was not talking about the war inside Afghanistan. I was talking about the war on terrorism. That's yeah. not over. And that's mainly because of this reason, because it has uh, further encouraged, the Taliban victory encouraged jihadist groups like uh, um, the uh, TTP and, and Pakistan. They have expressed uh, uh, happiness and they have also uh, expressed uh, uh, um, the intention to, uh, to be in power in, in, in Pakistan. I was reading a couple of documentaries yesterday where uh, uh, some Taliban folks in, in, in Pakistan in different Sabat and Quetta, uh, they were uh, uh, organizing people and talking about the Taliban's victory and how they, they achieved that victory. And there are the small uh, activities at this particular time, but that could certainly mobilize those, those, those groups inside, inside uh, uh, Pakistan at some point going forward. And the others also, and, and, and what I see that they, this will, the Taliban's victory will give rise to other insurgent groups to emerge, not only to the existing one to get to be strengthened, but for other insurgent groups to emerge. So th therefore I, I, I would see that will be creating um, uh, the Taliban's victory is a, is a cause for, for more transnational terrorist group to emerge in the region. Uh, especially if they will have problem with the financing and if it connects. So yes, overall, yes, the Taliban's victory have encouraged the jihadist movement across the, across the world and in the region in particular. Yeah, Aisha, I, I, I agree with what you said, but the, 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 the thing to point out is that will the Taliban themselves be involved in spreading jihad around the region? And that's where I think uh, probably not. Um, uh, because the Taliban will want to distance themselves from Pakistan. They will want to, I mean, the leadership will want to do that. And they will want to prove to the Afghans that they are Afghan and that they can run the country and, and uh, uh, in, in, the, in the image that they have for themselves. So that really doesn't involve outside groups as such. Although, as you're saying, and as Nilofar is saying, of course, the encouragement given to outside groups by this example of the Taliban conquering a country, defeating a superpower. I mean, this is going to reverberate in the region for a very long time to come. Ben, you want to add in to that or, or that's fine? Or should we just move on to the next question? Well, I feel, um, I mean, given the expertise on this panel, uh, I, I feel kind of a little bit wary to, to wait in here, but I've always thought of the Taliban as a poison pill for Pakistan. Um, and I think that that is going to be interesting to see as it plays out here. You know, what, what is the relationship between the Afghan Taliban and the uh, TTP going to be? What is the cross-border relationship with the Haqqani network going to be? And then, of course, as everybody wonders, you know, what is the relationship between ISI and the Taliban and between the different parts of the army and the Taliban? Um, I think in many ways that this is actually it should be much more worrisome to Pakistan than they, or to the Pakistani government than they seem to, to think it is because it's going to be, uh, at least have the potential as a great source of destabilization for Pakistan. 
Okay, should we move on to the next question? Sure. Yeah, I don't, there's, there's so many questions, but I think um, I'll pick one that um, goes into a slightly different direction. Uh, Sarah Khan posted in the chat. I understand how the gender oppression aspect is of critical importance. However, Afghanistan currently faces drought, economic crisis, COVID-19 on top of the instability. There's an impending food security crisis there. FAO has put up a request of urgent contribution of $36 million to address the agricultural and food situation in Afghanistan. How can these issues be highlighted in popular conversations in addition to the gender oppression aspect of Taliban? Nunafur, maybe you could take that on. Uh, that was very fast, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> I think you need, to, you need to say, read it a little slower. Sure. Is what um, <laughs> I'll, I'll read the, the crux of it. Um, so, the, the question is asking about the gender oppression aspect um, and, and in, in um, tandem with drought, economic crisis uh, and COVID. Um, so the question is asking, how can these issues be highlighted in popular conversations in addition to the gender oppression aspect of the Taliban? Got it, got it. So they're all human security crisis right now. That, that gender comes under it, gender operation, gender appetite, appetite that we are, we, are, we are using the term for it. And all the other human security crises, like especially uh, the humanitarian crisis that you highlighted, uh, I think there are two ways going forward. Uh, there, and there are two there are dilemmas actually in terms of how to highlight this issue and how to address them and how to work with them. First of all, recognizing Taliban is an issue right now, and uh, uh, many of this uh, of the issues that comes under human security, especially the uh, issues with the rights, with the human rights, women rights, and freedom of expression, and uh, name it, the, the humanitarian crisis, all, they will have a prominent and highlight phase for discussion once, once the international community or, the, or there's, a, there's a push from the international community and from the global power, let's put it that way, on the, on the Taliban. And that, I mean, that can happen only when Taliban are, are recognized, Taliban government uh, uh, is recognized. And, um, and, and, and by the way, there are also theories right now behind Taliban, little bit flexibility in terms of their interaction with the UN, and I was watching the, the chair of the uh, United Nations uh, for UNHCR yesterday when he was actually making an argument that he found a space, opportunities to talk about the issues that you highlighted here, Daniel, uh, with the Taliban. So according to him, according to his assessment, there is a space and opportunity to raise this issue with the Taliban to be, to exert pressure on them and to make this thing work. That's what, at least what we hear from this, uh, from this international community actors who are, especially the UN agencies who are. But, and that he was highlighting about the available space and opportunity. What I would see is, well, uh, uh, I don't see as, as, as uh, uh, Mr. Rashid also highlighted about the, uh, um, the change of the Taliban. I don't see that the Taliban are, are able to compromise uh, these issues, especially with the women and with the, uh, with the rights-based community, that aspect. Yes, there might, be, uh, um, there might be steps taken by the Taliban to address the humanitarian crisis. There will be actually, they have already turned their faces and asked for the support from international community to address the humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan. And there is those issues. And so they will take care of that. And, and they will be they will, they will ready to, uh, to, to, to support the international community, especially in terms of the addressing humanitarian crisis, but not the right-based issues. That will be a problem that going forward to work with the Taliban. I don't uh, see, at, at least at this point, we don't see any flexibility within the rules and policy towards women, towards uh, other kinds of freedoms. So that will be a challenge, but the conditionality might be a way going forward, especially even by the UN. Uh, the conditionality of this humanitarian fund, that could be a way going forward. The Taliban should uh, get something in return in order to get money to address the humanitarian issue or other issues that they are struggling with right now. So that, uh, that is an area uh, that I, I would see as a possibility for the, for the UN to intervene and exert pressure on the Taliban in return of some of those flexibility for the rights of women, for the rights of minorities, and the overall behavior with the public in large. Aisha, would you excuse me? I have to go now. I'm sorry. Um, I think you're on mute, Professor Jalal. Can I? Hello. Can you hear me? 
Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, thank you, Emma, uh, for, for this. And my apologies that we, we've uh, run out of time uh, for you. Uh, but I uh, hope, hope to have you back. This conversation is clearly not over uh, yet. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you again. Uh, so I think we now we still have two panelists. Uh, we could pr probably uh, uh, go up to 12.30. Uh, that was my initial view, uh, but I may have miscommunicated that. But we typically do it for 90 minutes, uh, Pizza, for your information. Okay, uh, so uh, is there any other question? Um, uh, yeah. Yes, go um, ahead. We can, I, I can take this one from the chat from um, Mo Energy. Uh, what are the ramifications for South Asian nations, especially India, which has lost significant diplomatic grounds in Afghanistan? What are the ramifications for the third world war between China and the US in Asia? Well, it's, uh, unfortunately, uh, both Rory and, but I think Ben and Nilofar are perfectly capable of answering this as well. Uh, uh, ben, you want to try this? Uh, Sure. Um, I'm just looking it up in the in the chat as well, so I'm sure that I have the wording. Um, I think unclear at the moment. Uh, you know, the 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 kind of back of the napkin um, calculus seems that this is advantageous for Pakistan and uh, um, bad for India and possibly positive for China. Um, but I think that uh, things are very unclear at the moment, and that both the short medium and indeed the long-term ramifications uh, are very difficult to gauge, that there, there's a lot of possibilities. I mean, so for example, I said that I've always thought the Taliban is a poison pill for Pakistan. It could play into Pakistan's short-term advantage that they gain um, essentially a friendly government in Kabul, which allows the uh, Pakistani security services to do things that they want to do, as it were. But I think long-term, it's actually gonna have a very destabilizing effect on Pakistan internally. Um, in terms of how this affects India, yeah, I mean, India was a um, close uh, diplomatic ally of the Karzai and the Ghani administrations um, and did definitely see an opening for its own broader regional uh, weight to be exercised, which now seems to be foreclosed uh, within Afghanistan. But, you know, it's going to be interesting to see what type of um, footing the Taliban tries to pursue in terms of relations with Delhi, because there's a significant diaspora community in India. Um, and then, of course, there's a, a lot of discussion about China stepping in um, to essentially be the main subsidizer of the Taliban government, um, either for their own strategic interests as part of the Belt and Road Initiative to kind of get back at the United States, or possibly their own economic interests. I mean, we have that kind of you know, infamous report from the US Department of Defense in 2011 that said there's a trillion dollars worth of um, mineral resources spread about Afghanistan. Um, but you know, when you look at that report, for example, much of that is economically unviable under the best of circumstances, much less when there is a lack of infrastructure to exploit it. So I, I, I think there's an open question about what attitude um, the Chinese were probably quite pleased with how things have turned out, at least for the moment, uh, will take in, in the medium to long term. Are they gonna seek to try and integrate Afghanistan into the CPEC with Pakistan, or are they gonna uh, be looking for other opportunities? Well, just in addition to India, I think India is, uh, is not happy with what happened with, in Afghanistan, especially with Taliban in power, that's a threat to, the, to, the, uh, to India because of their own security. And, and uh, if there will be any resistance inside Afghanistan against the Taliban going forward, uh, I would, uh, I would I, there's no doubt that uh, I think uh, the, in India will, will support that resistance uh, uh, against them. And uh, so, so uh, we, have, we have to again wait and see how the dynamics shape, shape as, as uh, Ben also mentioned about different other um, uh, business-based issue that's gonna come up. But at least uh, India is, uh, for the time being, uh, they are in the wait and see moment to cement its policy going forward. Uh, the same with Iran, the same with, with, with Russia, but they all know that, that Taliban are close to Pakistan. And they all know that Pakistan will have a different uh, um, uh, position in the region going forward, the strategic position in, in, the, in, in, the, in the region going forward. So therefore, they have a different level of relationship with Pakistan as well. But in terms of India, as I mentioned, if there will be resistance inside the country, they probably will, will support uh, that resistance against the Taliban. 
You're on mute, Dr. Jalal. Yeah, then you're on mute. Sorry. Uh, let's try. There's one question here that I'm struck by as one that perhaps we should end with. Uh, and that this is uh, by, um, uh, where is it? Uh, uh, with Diane uh, Jones. Uh, uh, Afghanistan's history is immense. Uh, why are we so obsessed by Afghanistan in the West? Um, uh, which I think is a rather a, a interesting question. Uh, uh, I mean, you know, this is, uh, I mean, there's Afghanistan and Afghanistan's concerns, uh, their own concerns about the security and welfare of their country. Then there's the region. But why is the West so concerned? Uh, I suppose that's the question. I mean, so the problem in Afghanistan is not the West's problem. I'd like to end with that. Uh, so Nilofar and uh, Ben, you are the only two left, but I think it's a very apt question. Um, I mean, you know, Afghanistan is a problem for Afghan. It's a problem for Pakistan, for Iranians, but why is it a problem for America? You're writing a book on the war that destroyed America. So, I mean, you know, why is it a concern for, for, for the West anymore? Ben, go ahead and start. <laughs> ben, I don't know for both of you. I think it's an ideal <laughs> That's question. That's a tough question, yeah. Go ahead. Start. <laughs> I, I mean, I'll take a stab. Yeah. Um, I'll be blunt. I don't think the United States gives a crap about Afghanistan anymore. Um, I think they're completely indifferent to it. I think that has been, if anything, the marked attitude of the United States since our entry into that war in 2001. At no point in the past 20 years was popular opinion solidly against this war. There were moments such as the pullout that said, this is a disaster, it looks terrible. But if anything, the public polling, not to mention the political calculus of the American political class has been market indifference. They just really don't care. And this is over there, out of eyesight. I mean, even the language that's now being used by the security establishment to describe the drone warfare over the horizon operations. Um, and to go to, um, Mr. Jones' point about history is immense. You know, um, if you look at the president's speeches, the three speeches he gave, where he, you know, first doubled down on his decision, then tripled, then quintupled, and, and et cetera, down on the decision to get off, out of Afghanistan. He put Afghanistan in this odd double bind, where on the one hand, he said, um, I think he said, decades of effort cannot undo centuries of history. So Afghanistan um, becomes trapped by its history which itself is actually ahistorical because the elements of history that trap Afghanistan, like its tribalism, which he also referred to, its ethnic strife, exist beyond time, right? And so it, it, it's this odd double bind that Afghanistan becomes trapped in. And uh, Neela Farr kindly invites me to talk to the, um, the State Department every once in a while. I always begin my lecture with this clip of Rambo Three, where he describes Afghanistan. And of course, the beginning quotation is Alexander the Great conquered this country. <laughs> and as I say to the students, the first documented American was a Pennsylvania Quaker named Josiah Harlan, who appears in Afghanistan in the 1830s and undertakes what in today's parlance would be a train and equip mission, which is a complete disaster. But from that point, the United States has a continued and intimate relationship with Afghanistan for the next 170 years, something that we totally forget. I mean, our generation today thinks that Afghanistan was conjured into existence with the September 11th attacks. If we go back to our 45-year-old from Rory's uh, uh, position, you know, it's conjured into existence with the Soviet Spitsnaz storming the Afghan presidential palace in 1979. And anything beyond that is this kind of ethereal haze where somewhere Alexander lands, there's a couple of tribes and it's a bunch of barbarians with one or two British defeats. It's the most ahistorical trapped by history story I think exists in the world today. So I'll turn it to you far, otherwise I'll keep going. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no, you highlighted the, the historical elements of this. I, I'll, I'll highlight the, the most uh, uh, policy-based discussion on the importance of Afghanistan and why it is still a, a, still a concern for the, for, the, for the West and for the regional power too, by the way. Uh, if you're following uh, if, uh, and if students are following, there's a lot happening regionally in terms of uh, China, Russia, Iran involvement in the region and what, uh, why they are why they are reaching out to the Taliban? Why one, one, Why they want to be get, Why they want to be involved in Afghan affairs? And why it's concern for them? I think the security, the security threats that if you are, if you talk from a policy perspective, the security threats that Afghanistan could pose to the global peace and to the regional peace, that is a concern for for these countries. 
And as far as the as, a, as, as far as Afghanistan has potential, insight potential to pose those threats to the region and to the global peace, I think the Afghanistan will be in news, and and that will because uh, because um, uh, both the West and the regional powers are trying to prevent that uh, that that security threats that Afghanistan could pose going forward, and in the past also that was there. Their, uh, their concerns. So I think, uh, yeah, uh, the country has uh, been uh, fragile, weak, uh, historically, and there were uh, lots of in internal potential to, uh, to for the radicalization, for the different version of, uh, of uh, extremism. We had the rebels change to other network and then network to uh, that those kept changing. The nature of terrorism kept changing over time. Historically, if you look at the the, uh, the 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 terrorism aspect. So and that because there are the, the situations are ripe. The internal situations, the fragility of the system, the socioeconomic conditions are are quite ripe. And on the other hand, Afghanistan has been used uh, uh, by the uh, by the global power and at the region historically uh, for their own uh, uh, for their own crisis uh, crisis. And uh, it's called an extra state war in international relations, where you fight your war outside your territory. So that was upon some played the nature of, it, uh, uh, of that of that particular nature, and the extra state war uh, played a role in in, in 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 making the country further fragile and unstable. So there are different elements, as Ben also has highlighted, the historical elements and there are the policy aspects uh, that that uh, that when we when we look at the the deeper uh, causes. We have to look at that particular that why policy wise the countries and the West are still interested, or that's still news and why we are so obsessed with that. So I think there are those factors. But again, the security threats uh, that the the West and the global power uh, face uh, from Afghanistan that make them uh, um, have a security centric policy uh, uh, for Afghanistan and make them obsessed uh, to to continue this 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 talks about the country. Well, thank you. And, and obviously, after a 20 or 43 year long engagement with Afghanistan, America has a lot of debt as well, um, uh, and not to mention European countries. I mean, we've been hearing about all those people who've been abandoned uh, after the withdrawal uh, who would like to leave. Um, so I, I think that this notion that the, now that the war is over and American troops are no longer on the ground, it's all, why should Afghanistan be, be, be concerned with it? I mean, that's an attitude. Uh, but I think that our panelists have made amply clear why ignoring Afghanistan can only be done at our own peril. Um, so thank you again um, to the panelists and to the other two. Uh, and I apologize to those whose questions we couldn't take, uh, but we needed to give our panelists uh, a comfortable amount of time so that they could express what they had to say. And I think we've had a terrific uh, uh, panel. Thank you so much, Ben. Uh, thank you, Nilofa. Um, and uh, I know this is not the last, but uh, let's hope uh, that things will somehow uh, get better somehow. <laughs> take care. Bye -bye. Thank you, Dr. Jalal. Thank you, Aisha. Take care. Bye-bye.